Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Tenement Museum Virtual Book Talk. My name is Lana Jubin, and I'm the Collections Manager at the Tenement Museum. I am so excited tonight to be joined in conversation by ben Manal and Wassam Kahai. They are the founders of Eat Off Beat, and we are going to be discussing their cookbook today, The Kitchen Without Borders, a gorgeous cookbook. Oh, beautiful. All of us have our copies, all three. <laughs> Um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them in the chat, and we will return to them later in the talk. There will be around a 15-minute question and answer session towards the end. Um, we will also be sharing a link to purchase The Kitchen Without Borders, and I will mention, too, that um, Eat Off Beat will be offering a discount holiday box um, if you use the code TENEMENT10, so we'll discuss that at the end as well. Um, lastly, if you're a fan of the Tenement Museum and you're connecting with the stories we tell about immigrants, migrants, and refugees, please consider donating or even becoming a member so that we can continue to share these stories with an even broader audience. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Manal and Wassam, and we are going to get started. So let me share this beautiful image. Okay. So um, Manal, for all of our viewers who might not have had a chance to grab a copy of the book, can you share how the company came to be? Absolutely, and before we do that, Lana, I wanna thank you for having us tonight. I wanna thank the Tenement Museum for continuous support throughout uh, all of those, uh, you know, all of our years. We're really, really excited to be here. Um, so like you mentioned, my name is Manal Kahi. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Eat Off Meat. And we as a company deliver authentic meals that are entirely conceived, prepared and delivered by refugees who now call New York City home. Uh, um, we started, we, we, we got started in 2015, back in 2015, and it all started, I personally had come to the US as a student. Uh, I'm from Lebanon originally. I came for my graduate degree. Wissam was already here a couple, he came a couple of years before me and he'll tell you a bit more about his own story. Uh, but when I came to New York, I was coming again to study environmental affairs, uh, but one thing that happened is that I got very disappointed with hummus in grocery stores or hummus as we call it uh, back home or in the Middle East. Um, I knew, I knew, you know, I, we saw I was being sold everywhere. I was just not up to our st standards in a way, right? So I started making my own hummus. I called my grandmother, got her recipe, started making it at home and that kind of became successful. I would take it with me to Isam's place. He would send, give it to some of his neighbors. They would love it. My friends at, in, in grad school, like every time there was a party, they would say, Manal, can you bring your hummus? That, that, that's yeah. fantastic. And I'll let you in on a secret here. It's not even, I'm a good cook. I'm not a great cook. So it's not even the best hummus I've had, but people really. <laughs> and that kind of told us that there's something about food or dishes that have a story to them, right? That are made as cliche as that might sound, they're made with love, right? They're made, you know, with purpose. I, it's my grandmother's recipe. I would do it, you know, with a bit of a, some, some level of passion, right? And that resonated with people. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of gave us early on, maybe to give you some, some context, that was 2013. It was the midst of the refugee crisis back home. Um, in Lebanon, it wasn't a thick thing yet here, but in Lebanon, we had at the time about 2 million Syrian refugees being resettled from Syria into Lebanon in a country of 4 million people, 4 to 5 million people. So you can only imagine the level of uh, issues that refugees were safe, facing in the country, local communities were safe, facing in the country. So it wasn't, you know, it was something at least in the back of, of our mind. Uh, I had personally left the country with a bit of the guilt in the back of my mind. So we were kind of looking for ways to help. So when we started thinking, who could bring the best hummus to New York? Uh, another piece of context, my grandmother who gave us the, who gave me the, the hummus recipe basically was from Aleppo, from Syria. So when we started thinking, there she is, her name was Teta Jano. We called her lovingly Teta Jano. Um, she, she had given me the, the hummus recipe basically. So when we started thinking of who could bring the best hummus to New York, we thought of Syrian refugees being resettled in New York back at the time, and we knew they would have, you know, a great recipe, just like our grandmothers, uh, that they could share with New Yorkers. Uh, knowing the culture, we also knew they would love to share their, their recipes. They would love to share food with, uh, with local communities, basically. So that's really what sparked the idea. We never really sold the hummus per se. Immediately, we jumped from 
that idea, we started thinking, why not make it more global? Why not have chefs from all over the world or refugees from all over the world bring to New York all of those recipes that just like hummus are so much better when they're homemade, when they're made with love. Uh, when they, those people making it, right? Those chefs, they, they really know what those flavors represent, what they are, how they go well together, you know, well, at, what, at exactly what point you have to turn off the, the heat. Um, so that was real. That's how we went from the idea of selling good, authentic hummus to the idea of selling authentic food that's really off the beaten path because it's representing cuisines from uh, refugee chefs from, from all around the world, basically. Uh, we'll tell you a bit more maybe later on on kind of what happened later, because obviously in the very first days we, we were doing primarily corporate catering mm -hmm. uh, between 2015 and 2020. Uh, We'll talk about what happened with in 2020. So if you want, just so uh, to leave room for 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 some of, some of that uh, for later. But we primarily started as a caterer, and we primarily did uh, corporate catering between 2015 and 2020. Wonderful. Anything to add to that, Wissam? Did I miss anything in the story? I think it was perfect, complete. <laughs> And um, for our viewers too, can you speak a little bit about your relationship? Um, who's the older sibling? Um, that dynamic between the two of you. You can't tell? <laughs> I, I, uh, I was hoping it, maybe it's not very clear on camera that I have some white hair and <laughs> some white beard, but I, I'm the older sibling by quite a few years actually. Uh, so uh, obviously we, uh, I, I came here earlier than Manal. Uh, we share the same grandmother and the same love for food and the same nostalgia. So when I tasted the hummus that Manal brought back with her, I also uh, was very passionate about the venture and the story. And I thought there's something that we can do there. So became co-founder and uh, we've been working on this since. It's been seven years now. Lovely. And do you enjoy working together? We do. Most of the time. Yes. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lovely. And so we talked a little bit about the evolution of the company, um, how you started with cor corporate catering and more experiences. Um, up here on the slide, we have a few of the other um, offerings that you have. But I'm curious about how you came up with the idea for this cookbook. Yeah, so that initially started, you know, again, we were doing catering um, starting in 2015, basically. And we realized there were so many people who wanted in on our story, right? They wanted to be part of the community, but they did not necessarily host any catering. They could not afford a minimum of whatever it was, say $200, $300 to host people for, for a catered event, or they did not have an opportunity to actually have food catered. So we started thinking, how can we actually connect with those people? Because for us as a company, and that's something I haven't mentioned in, in the initial introduction, we have three goals as a company. The first is to create quality jobs for talented refugees who want to be in the food industry, basically. Uh, the second is to build bridges, build connection between our chefs cooking at our kitchen, all of us as a team cooking at our kitchen and our customers having our food at home or at the office. And the third goal for us as a company is to change the narrative around refugees uh, and immigration to a certain extent, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, by, by showcasing a different and a more positive story. It's a story where refugees are the chefs, they are the heroes, they are the ones helping New York discover something new and something different and not the other way around. We're, mm -hmm. It's not a charity, we're actually a for-profit business. Uh, our chefs are employees, they're partners in the business, they're active contributors to the local economy and that's really, the, the story that we want to tell, which is what it is, right? <laughs> We're not creating an, a different narrative, which is very common in many, many like uh, refugee stories, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, with that in mind, when we think especially about like creating a new narrative, sharing our stories as people, um, really building on what we're doing and connecting with more and more people, that's kind of how we started thinking the easiest way to do that is to come up with a cookbook. We had all of these recipes, incredible recipes from all of our chefs. We were already serving those to our customers. The next step, it kind, it kind of only seemed natural that the next step would be to create a cookbook. And what we first did, we needed money to do that. Obviously, we did not have enough money to start uh, to venture into creating a cookbook. So we started a Kickstarter campaign. 
And that was wildly successful. We raised close to $100,000 within um, a month or so. Uh, we had about 2,000 contributors or 2,000 backers from 54 different countries who actually contributed to the Kickstarter yeah. campaign. And part of those who saw that Kickstarter campaign is our friends at Workman Publishing. So they, uh, I can't remember if they reached out, we reached out, but basically we ended up having a deal with Workman Publishing who said, hey, we can help you take your idea for a small self-published cookbook to a much more you know, powerful, really well done, up to like industry standards, if not like way better than, than, than industry standards. Uh, and that's really what we did. We were really happy we worked with Workman Publishing, uh, our editors, everyone on the team there, because uh, they, they actually helped us really elevate our stories personally, our, our chef's stories, the company stories, and, and all of the recipes that our chefs uh, wanted to share. Wonderful. Absolutely. And what I find so interesting is um, how the conception of the cookbook, it's very aligned with a um, hundred years ago, what immigrants and refugees were doing for their communities. So self-publishing um, cookbooks with synagogues or with churches to maintain food traditions. But what's interesting is that this is less about maintaining a food tradition for a specific um, group, but it's, it's more about sharing the those food traditions and sharing the passion um, with a wider audience. So I find that that mission is extremely interesting when you look at um, how immigrants and refugees were sharing their food traditions in the past versus today. Absolutely, um, because the way we see it, it's only adding value, right? New York is already so rich and it's only becoming ever richer, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and this is a a great example of, you know, when you first moved to New York City, you would call home for the recipes and you speak about how it would make your grandmother's day. Your family would be so excited that you were asking how to make something. And that was the specific question. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak more about that specific recipe, your grandmother's hummus, but also why you think that sharing the recipes was so exciting for your family, not just a hello, but a question about the history. Um, I'll start with Sam. I'm sure you also have your own perspective on, on those calls. I usually, whenever I miss home, uh, whenever I'm homesick, like food from, you know, my family's food is the, the only thing that can, uh, the second best thing to actually going there, right? Is having food that kind of reminds me, the flavors, the smells, even cooking it, that's kind of what reminds me of home. So. And it's never the same. I could go to a Lebanese restaurant and get a dish, but it's never the same. It doesn't hit that spot, right? It has to be my grandmother's, like what I was used to eat when I went to her house mm -hmm. uh, or our aunts. We have an aunt, Tant Margo, we call her lovingly, who's, who was an amazing home cook, right? So it's really her, like there's a very specific recipe that I need and that's her recipe. It's very different if I get it from a restaurant. Uh, so that's why I would call them to get that exact same recipe. It never turned down the same. Again, I'm not as good as, as they are. They've had much more practice and they're so, so passionate, so good at it. Uh, but that's why I would call them to get that, uh, that specific recipe. Uh, I'm sure we some, I don't know if we were calling about the same recipes. I know we, we each have different <laughs> favorite recipes, basically. Yeah, I often call when I have like a gap in, uh, in the recipe and I want to fill that gap. I, hey, what, what do you do in that step? And uh, that's mm -hmm. where they help. Uh, but just to build on what Manal is saying, uh, like many other families, there's a very strong connection through food in the family. And uh, for many members, whether it's our grandmother, our aunt, our mother, uh, it's, th they show their love sometimes through the food that they cook and through certain recipes and how much effort they put into, into the recipe. Um, so it's, it's a way to reconnect with them. And sometimes it's not necessarily very traditional recipes. My favorite recipe at my grandmother was potatoes with chicken. Mm. But mm. for whatever reason, the way that she cooked it is extremely special. Nobody else, I, I could never replicate that. And nobody else could replicate it the same way. Uh, so, you know, you remember these memories mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, it creates a bond. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting how this idea of like the food of home, it's, you know, the food of your homeland, but it's so much more specific of that. It's like the food of the specific hands of your family member that's making it. Um, 
and and throughout the book too, when you interview um, each of the chefs, there quite a few of them speak about these moments where family members are teaching them recipes and they can get specific um, family heirlooms like fryers if they make the recipe the best um, or if their parent says that they made the recipe as good as they did. And there's this immense set of pride in really trying to replicate things um, and, and trying to get this this family touch directly into the food. Um, so I find that quite interesting, this generational path of, um, of knowledge being shared. And I'm curious too, um, how did your first group of chefs connect with Eat Off Beat? How'd you find the chefs? Um, so yeah, we, we can rewind back to 2015 mm -hmm. on when we started with the idea, when Manal brought the idea and we're like, where do we find? talented people that can cook these recipes. And the connection came through the International Rescue Committee, through the IRC, who uh, is an organization that tries to resettle refugees around the world, and in particular for the New York chapter in New York, and helps them in particular finding uh, job opportunities. So through the contact with the IRC, uh, we said, hey, this is the venture, this is the idea, what do you think? And they had in mind, and at that time, uh, three ladies who were talented cooks. We said, okay, let's give it a try. So what's the interview like? Not everyone spoke great English. So the only thing that we could do at the interview is, you know, go meet them, watch each other, and of course, taste some food. So uh, <laughs> we went to that office and it was Manal, myself and our third partner at the time, who uh, Juan Suarez de Leso, who's also an author here, one of the authors obviously was leading the recipe development here. So he, uh, there you go, that's Juan right there. So uh, Juan is, is a chef, uh, actually very uh, talented chef who worked in Michelin star restaurants and who was leading, uh, leading the team. But at that time, it was the three of us and we wanted his opinion. And we went there and we were, I mean, all, all of us were a bit skeptical. We went to this office, we see three people and we have no idea who they were. We couldn't really speak to them and uh, everybody was smiling and they gave us the interview is they, they uh, we started tasting the food. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started tasting the food of the three, uh, in my mind, something clicked immediately because Surprisingly, even though it's not my home culture, I, it brought back similar memories to eating my home food. There was something very authentic, very homey about it that uh, connected immediately with me and I, I loved it. And when Juan Suarez de Leso tasted the food because I wanted the opinion of somebody, hey, who works in the industry, I could see the same spark in his eyes immediately and then he told us later and that's when we figured out hey it's uh, it's becoming true this makes sense and there's something very very special here so that's how it started and um and the rest is uh, <laughs> rest almost history not history yet but it started with a few events few catering events not full-time but quickly evolved to uh, to a full-time uh, full-time job and I found it fascinating. Um, in the book, sometimes you say what the chefs cooked for their interview. And I was very inter interested that not all of them are these, um, you know, authentic dishes from their homeland. In fact, one of the chefs cooked a cauliflower and cheese dish. Um, and when asked why, said that she likes cheese. Um, so I was really interested about that interview process and how, um, you kind of give the chefs direction or just allow them to express themselves. Can you speak a little bit more how that process goes? You're actually seeing a photo of an actual interview. That was our very second interview. So that was the second interview we've ever done. Those interviews, I think that's my favorite part of the entire, like all of my job, basically. <laughs> uh, usually we have candidates come in. In this case, it was four or five different candidates, sometimes there's more, they come in with representative from the IRC. And it's really, it's a top chef style of, uh, you know, where this is our pantry, this is all of the ingredients that we have, make something. That's the only direction we give. 
And we realized that it's, it's a stressful situation, right? We're like, sometimes you don't have that one ingredient that you need, but this is part of the process. We wanna see how people react to that, how they can kind of get by. And the most important thing, the only criteria we look at when we're hiring new chefs is their passion for food and their passion to share their culture through food. Those are, that's the only two things we, we, we look at. Everything else, English proficiency, uh, prior experience, we don't care. It, it doesn't matter if someone has never worked in the past, this is their very first job, they've never been in a professional kitchen, it doesn't matter. As long as they have that passion for food, that's all we need. And we can immediately see that. Honestly, I mean, obviously, usually it's Juan who, who does uh, more of the, the culinary um, choices, let's say. Uh, but for me, it, it's enough for me to see how someone holds a tomato and starts chopping it mm -hmm. to notice that passion, right? You just see it immediately, right? And then the end result, sometimes it's not, obviously they were missing a certain spice or there's an ingredient they didn't find. So it's not necessarily, you can still feel it when someone is really passionate about it. So that's still how we run our um, uh, interviews. Hmm. And even in the book that's reflected, you have a list of, let me turn to it and demonstrate a list of ingredients um, in the beginning of the book. And most of them are like, all of them are featured in the recipes, but I found it interesting thinking about um, how you provide almost like no substitutions. It's basically, if you can't find, here's the list of ingredients, but if you can't find certain ingredients, don't even bother trying to substitute, just make the dish as you make it. Um, and I found that really interesting um, when thinking about now knowing about your interview process, how even the cookbook has a similar flavor to it, if you pardon the pun, of um, just trying to create good, delicious food, but not necessarily being so precious over the exact ingredient or trying to find the exact authentic, you know, replication of it. Um, I like that there's alternatives. There's a recipe for paneer. So in case you can't find it in the store, you can do that. Um, there's certain substitutions. So I found that interesting how that parallels with the interview. Absolutely. And the chefs always know, right? If there's, because it's really the, the recipes that we're featuring, that we're offering our customers are whatever they cook at home, even now, right? It's whatever they used to cook, but it's also what they cook for their families today in the US. And they've often found a way to substitute for a certain ingredient in a way that maintains that authenticity for them. And mm -hmm. that's part of why, I mean, we might talk a bit about, about that in a little bit, authenticity, what that means. For us, we define it as chef, I'm trying to, to think chef Shanti's own recipe, right? The way she makes it for her son, Sarujan. That's the recipe we are selling you. That's what you are getting when you're, when you're having a meal box with us or when you're catering an event with us. Uh, so that's what makes an, a recipe authentic for us. We're never pretending that we're into, like, uh, who knows exactly what Sri Lankan, all of Sri Lankan cuisine is, right? There are so many different ways to make one specific dish. And talking about hummus itself, every single family likes it a bit differently, right? Uh, Wissam and I have different tastes with hummus. I like it a bit smoother. He likes it a bit more uh, coarse, right? It's, it's a bit different, but it's still two very authentic recipes, right? And what makes it so authentic is the fact that it's my own recipe that I am sharing with someone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and it's the, go ahead. Mark. It's the mixture, obviously, we, th there's the traditional recipes that you find. There's the traditional food in our kitchen, but there's also what Manal described which is the authentic and it's authentic in the sense that it hasn't been adapted necessarily to meet a, mm -hmm. a particular American palette or anything. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the way they like it. It may have been adapted to the current ingredients, to the ingredients that they can find locally, but it's still their own recipes. And it's, uh, it's very personal there. It's almost like an artist. You're not making art for the viewer. You're making art for yourself and then the viewer can appreciate it. So they're not changing it because they think that people might like it less spicy or they think that it might be this better this way. It's, it's a personal expression. Um, it's a personal expression, but we have, we have uh, just to continue with the art uh, analogy, we have an art, uh, uh, you know, a specialized art dealer who is Chef Juan, for example, who used to say <laughs> to be the filter if you want, and made sure that everything that passed the filter, and a lot of things did, 
were uh, high quality. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's actually talk about, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but let's talk about Juan as the filter. Um, so the kitchen seems like a very collaborative environment and you speak about, um, developing new recipes and having the repertoire. So I'm curious about how that collaboration works in the kitchen under Chef Juan's purview as you're developing new recipes. By the way, th this is a photo of our very first uh, catered event, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and, and maybe t talking a little bit about um, uh, keeping it authentic or that filter that, that we saw mentioned, it's not necessarily a filter of what's good and what's not good. It's mostly a filter of what's good given the conditions, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, we're delivering our food, so it has to stand the test of delivery. Uh, we're sending it, sending it for catering, so it has to be, you know, just as good the moment we cook it as it would be for four hours later. So that's really mm -hmm. the filter that's there. The other filter is also making sure that it's harmonized, that whatever we're serving, if we're serving a rice dish, that it goes really well with that chicken dish from someone, from a different uh, chef. Um, in terms of how we develop recipes, usually our best bet, and to this day, that's kind of still how it goes, right? We have family meal, which happens every day, family meal in the restaurant industry. That's when the whole restaurant team actually stops, takes a break for, for lunch and just ha has a meal together, right? And usually it's someone on the team who prepares family meal. Uh, so every day, and usually for family meal, our chefs, they're not necessarily making the same dishes that we are serving our customers. That's where they make kind of like at home that your thought process of, okay, what am I gonna make today based on what ingredients there are? They just make something. And this is really where we do most of our testing. Uh, Chef Shanti prepares a new eggplant dish. Uh, Chef uh, Rashana makes a, a, a cauliflower dish. We try then very often, this is where we land on our best recipes during family meal, right? So that goes through uh, uh, kind of, that's one of the layers of testing. Obviously, since then we've come a long way. We have a very specific process from, to develop recipes, right? From the moment we just test them to the moment they actually go on the menu. So there is mm -hmm. a, a long process that I, I, I don't wanna bore you with, with those details, uh, but it's still kind of, it still originates from family meal or sometimes there are very specific um, requests. So we're like, okay, we need a new salad. We need more greens. We get feedback from customers saying we need more grains or we need less carbs. So mm -hmm. we tell that to our chefs and we try to see what people, uh, come up with basically mm. that's um that's been it's been the same the same process since we started <laughs> for almost 10 years yeah oh actually a little less seven now <laughs> a little less seven. Oh yeah 2013 ah oh, i rounded up so. <laughs> so because we the concept was 2013 but we actually yeah. started in 2015 yes well I'll, I'll give you the extra two years <laughs> <laughs> um and so Speaking about this family and community, let me turn to page 97. So you have this page here called A Day in the Kitchen, and it talks about the schedule starting at 7 a.m. And it's not necessarily um, just focused on timing to get the food out the door. The things focused on who makes the playlist for the day and is it a coffee day or is it a tea day and who is preparing the beverage for the day? Um, who is going to help another person prep dishes and get the delivery out and who is making sure that the delivery people have coffee. So it's really interesting looking at not just the chefs themselves having this community, but the whole organization from the delivery people all the way to the music that you're playing. Um, and so I'm curious how you, how you cultivated that sense of family community in the kitchen beyond the family meal. I think honestly, it's just a natural feel. And I think it also starts with family meal, right? I'm mentioning this again and again, uh, but we, Sam and I, we're, we're family. Uh, everyone on the team, there's actually a bunch of family members on the team too. I'll mention too, Chef Shanti, her son, Sarujan, actually runs the delivery team. She's she's a chef. Her son has been with us. He started out as a delivery person. Now he's, he's running the whole delivery team. He's also in charge of producing content. So usually if you see photos on the website, he's the one behind the camera. He's the one who, uh, who took them. Um, a, a bunch of other, op uh, sorry, um, uh, examples too, like Bashir, who's from Afghanistan, both of his sons used to help us with deliveries. So there's a lot of this family feeling in the kitchen. At the same time, I think 
we're talking about people who have been, us as immigrants, other team members as refugees, as, as immigrants, we've been through similar situations in many cases. Um, and I think that kind of creates a bond that regardless of what languages you speak. And very often, you know, I think at one point we had 14 different languages spoken wow. on, on, on the team, right? Regardless of that, and very few who were super proficient in English, right? It didn't mm -hmm. matter. Now everyone kind of learns with, with time. But regardless of that, there's some bond that's created. Um, it's kind of, we have shared experiences, I would say, that kind of create some sort of a, of a bond that just makes it feel like family. And to a certain extent, we really see our customers as an extension to that family because when our chefs are cooking at the kitchen, it's a commercial kitchen space, right? It's fully certified. It's not, they're not cooking at home, uh, but they're still cooking the way, well, kind of the, the, the way they, they, uh, they cook at home, right? And when they're cooking, they're still cooking as if they were cooking for their families. So our customers in a way, they are an extension of our families basically. So that's why I believe the concept of family is very, very ingrained in, in all of us. And it's kind of a, a natural, it's not necessarily something we actively work towards. Obviously it's something we, we appreciate and we want to uh, keep going, but we haven't had, luckily, I think we were very lucky in that sense where it just happens, it's, it's organic. And by the way, you see our parents in this photo, by the way, they're, they're <laughs> my father here. So definitely a, a family feeling at the kitchen. A full family kitchen. Love it. And I love seeing multiple garlics. We have a garlic. I was trying to do like a I spy. How many tubs of garlic can I find in the kitchen? I love garlic. I love garlic too. We all love it. Um, and so excellent transition speaking about the family. Um, you mentioned how many of the children work in the deliveries, help you with the website. Um, they've picked up shifts. And um, thinking about the future of Eat Off Beat and the future of the company, how do you see it growing? Oh, we some, I, I, I can answer this oh. one if you want to add, add anything. And by the way, you're talking about uh, family members. This is Sarujan. If you can see him, he's, he's holding uh, Shanti on the, on the left side. So, oh, uh, yes. Mother and son, son, and there's a beautiful relationship there. Sarujan oh. is kind of... He's her son, but I feel like he's a mother to everyone in a sense. He's the one who takes care of everyone, everyone who makes sure everyone is fed. When I go to the kitchen, like, he's always there making sure, did you have lunch today? He makes sure everyone get, gets uh, gets what they need. So just a, a shout out to, uh, to Sarujan. Um, and the question was uh, growth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we see, like I'm... I mean, like we mentioned earlier, we started out as a caterer. We grown, we were doubling our sales year over year between 2015 and 2020. Um, uh, we were very comfortable in that, in that line of business, if you will. But then COVID happened. So with COVID, we had to completely pivot. And I believe you're, should, should we talk a bit about that right now? Or should I? Yeah, that? we could talk about that. Um, let's see if there's a... I'll show I this. I want to go back that. to the very first. Uh, so I, I'll tell you kind of what happened with uh, with with COVID. Basically, um, when COVID happened, there was a week, or when when it started back in March, I think that will resonate with with everyone. I'm, I'm not going to tell you the story again, but basically, we lost 100 percent of our revenue within two to three days. Right? It was two to three days where all of our business uh, customers were calling us: Can we cancel? Can we do this? Can we do that? And we were obviously faced with the decision of: Do we keep going or do we just stop? And our chefs, it came from the team. We had we had a team. Obviously, we were scared. We, no one knew what, what was happening. We were scared for our own health. But the team felt like we kind of have a duty towards New York to kind of, no, we're going to keep coming. If we're not here to cook for New Yorkers, how is everyone going to eat? So there was this sense of duty where we felt like, we, we like to say, uh, pun intended, but we wanted to return the favor with flavor. So New York hosted us so warmly, we, we really wanted to return that favor with flavor. Um, uh, so what we did back then is we took our best sellers from catering, we repurposed them, we packaged them a bit differently, we put them in a box, and we started delivering those boxes directly to our customer's home instead of going to their office. So instead of catering at the office, we started delivering meal boxes directly to our customers at home. And that's the meal box you see uh, right here on the left side of, uh, uh, of this photo. So this started out kind of as an 
initially just to survive the storm, but it turned into what today is a full-on subscription program. So today we actually offer monthly boxes. So you can subscribe to a monthly service. Every month you receive a meal box that looks just like this one. Uh, it has four, six, or 12 different meals. It's up to you to choose. It can be fully vegan or it can be vegan and meat-based. Um, and usually it's a different theme every month. So every month we're introducing you to a new country or a new theme from, from around the world. From, from around the world, basically, that's all made by our chefs. So today we're, we have a box running that's around the holidays from around the world. So it, it's representing all of the feasts uh, or all of the holiday dishes that our chefs make at home. That's what uh, we are serving this box. Other examples we've had in Afghanistan, a spotlight on Afghanistan in the past. We will be in the near future, we'll have uh, a spotlight on Myanmar or Burma. We have a spotlight on Palestine coming up. We have, uh, a spotlight on grains from around the world. So that's really the type of uh, themes that we see uh, uh, coming up. Uh, other than meal boxes and that subscription program, we also started noticing that we had customers outside of New York City. We wanted to serve them. So we started, and we couldn't send this is fresh, this is fully prepared meals, by the way, with the meal boxes, they're fully prepared, they're delivered cold and ready to reheat so that they're ready for you, they're in your fridge whenever you're, you're, you're ready to have uh, your meal over the entire week. Um, when we started thinking of how can we send those or how can we serve people outside of New York, uh, that's where we created longer shelf life products. So that includes jams, snacks, uh, peanuts, uh, all sorts of longer shelf life products basically that are again, made at our kitchen by our chefs based on their family recipes. Uh, but those, and that's the second uh, photo that you see right here, those ship nationwide. So those, it started out as a holiday gift box around the holidays of last year. We're still selling that uh, this year as a holiday gift box and they're, they're, they're perfect for, for gifts basically, uh, and that ships nationwide. Uh, we're still doing some level of corporate catering and corporate experiences. It hasn't picked up fully yet. We're still waiting, you know, that's, I don't think it's an answer that anyone here can, it's a question that anyone here can answer, but basically we're still offering it when it comes, you know, whenever we, we get requests. So if anyone is catering, we're, we're here to, uh, to do that. I think I may have geared away from your actual question. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. No, it's, com it's completely, it's how has the business pivoted over the past year due to the pandemic, but it's also really interesting to think about how the business has pivoted over the timeline of the business. Um, so Right. And I mean, you were asking about growth. It's because mm -hmm. that's why for us to talk about growth, like it's important to see where we're at today. Um, for our growth, like again, those are the three main lines of business that we are uh, um, into or, or growing, basically. Um, so for us, it's really about growing those subscriptions, right? Going nationwide. Uh, today, we're only delivering in New York. We are hoping that we can bring that, can start shipping nationwide or maybe replicate the same model in a different uh, in a different place so that we can serve more and more people, right? So they can, we can connect with more, more and more people. So that's really um, where we stand. And obviously keep going with catering if that's something, if and when that comes back. Yeah, Isam, I mean, I anything else? Uh, Sorry. No, I mean, you asked the question about growth and you mentioned that the chef's children working. Well, I hope we will grow and we will have the grandchildren someday. <laughs> Create opportunities for them, I guess. <laughs> That'd be beautiful. But, that, that would be beautiful, yes. Yeah. Um, and two, with, with the corporate experience, I mean, we all know that New York is having all the offices um, coming back and then going back home. It's been um, a long, almost two years of that process. Um, but thinking about other experiences, I'm sure like weddings and other events and personal parties, it's interesting for me to think about um, a family business catering for family-based events. So how you've kind of turned from going more corporate, more of a work environment to really going directly family to family, um, your family to the home family. Yes. Mm -hmm. I find that an interesting yeah. connection. Um, and so I'm going to, I think, scroll. These photos are just showing the cook cookbook process. Yeah, so that's the early version of, of the cookbook when it was printed on actual paper, right? And that's when the chefs first saw it. This is our editor, Liz, who's been wonderful to work with. 
Um, and the rest of the team, Penny, the photographer is here when they came to visit the kitchen. So this is kind of when we were editing recipes, uh, um, all of that. The photos you, you were seeing right before are photos of when the, the chefs first saw the very first draft of, uh, of the cookbook. Actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very exciting moment actually for all of us. <laughs> Yeah, they all look pleased with how their food is being represented. Exactly, so. especially the photography, right? It was amazing yeah. for all of us to at, like, you know, see all of, all of those photos that were incredibly well done, right? With uh, um, Penny de los Santos, who's an incredible photographer and the whole team who helped her, right? Everyone who was um, doing the design uh, or the editing of the photos, uh, it's beautiful photography. They're just beautiful, the textures, the colors. Um, like even the grains of salt are just gorgeous on these people. <laughs> um, I recommend if you're reading it, don't read it on an empty stomach or do if you're planning <laughs> on, um, cooking. order ahead, order ahead. <laughs> yeah. Order ahead, order, order, eat up feed and then read the book. <laughs> um, so one of my final questions is, um, you, actually you know what I'm going to go back to the authenticity before I ask about the about Dia's story um but I wanted to read a little just a quick passage so what I found really interesting about the book was that you have recipes you have the biographies of the various chefs but then you also have um almost like history um texts you have history of different regions and curry is a catch-all the history of of curry and what it means and how the name has changed. And so to me, it's really interesting, this combination of like an anthropological exploration of people's lives um, an oral history with people, and then also um, like a detailed history project. So it's, it's quite interesting, but one quote that I have, um, it's in, it's on this recipe for Manchurian cauliflower, which looks phenomenal, it looks so tasty. And it's talking about how um, Nepal and Indo-Chinese dishes, Manchurian is kind of a catch-all phrase for it, um, but it's, it's not a recipe, it's a technique. And so the, the quote is, when Rachana brought the dish to the eat off beat kitchen, the recipe changed even more. So this is speaking about Rachana adopting her um, cauliflower recipe. So what makes for an authentic recipe? At eat off beat, it's what the chefs bring to the kitchen from their own experiences in homelands, but it's also the ways in which they adapt to their new customer base in New York and the ingredients that are available to them. And so we've been speaking about this for a while about adapting and the ingredients and the specificity of New York. But I was wondering if you could speak more about that. You mentioned wanting to potentially open up in other locations, um, it, this book is almost a kind of a love letter to like the New York City community. So I was wondering if you could speak towards that. Absolutely. I mean, again, I think I mentioned that earlier, but we do see our customers as an extension of our family. And that's really the case. We did talk a bit about our pivot during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, our community, you know, our customers, some of our friends, they immediately rallied. When we started uh, those meal boxes, immediately we had tons of orders. We sent an email to our customers saying, hey, we lost our, right, our main source of, of income, basically. And mm -hmm. orders started flowing in. So we really knew we could count on our customers, in, in, in a sense, uh, to survive. And they've been, that's part of why we survived until today. Now, obviously, we wouldn't have survived if the food wasn't good, right? If they didn't yeah. like the product, they wouldn't come. They wouldn't be coming back. So obviously, they do like. They enjoy the food. They love the food. Uh, they do see value in that, and that's why they're coming back. And obviously, uh, that's uh, what keeps us going too. Uh, but we really know it's a community we can uh, we can count on. We can count on uh, here here in New York. It's also you know. New York is already so rich. Uh, we, uh, I don't know, we some, I think you feel the same too. We rarely feel as strangers in, in the city, right? Even though I personally, you know, I have a, I have an accent. I'm not necessarily, you know, I may not necessarily look American, but I just, I feel like I belong here. And I think it stands for most of our, if not all uh, of our chefs and our team members. Uh, we just feel at home. Uh, this city has given us a home and I've said that already, but we're really hoping to return the favor with uh, with flavor, basically, and add something new uh, to what the city has to offer. 
I think also what you described with the with the recipes coming, being very personal, mm-hmm. and adapting to the local ingredients and to what we find here is a good illustration of the experience of the immigrants that mm-hmm. we are and they are as well. That come they come with the with their full person with their authenticity and then they have a welcoming community here that is already extremely diverse and it's not forcing them to adapt to anything. You know, they, they bring their food. We bring our food too. And, uh, and you know, and we, we enrich the scene, the culinary scene in New York and the diversity of New York. So, and I think that's what makes the chefs and us happy is they find acceptance on the other end and not, not only acceptance, they find joy and happiness and people that love their food and that are welcoming them. And it's, it's not always obvious when I think you first arrive here that this will be the reaction, but it has been mostly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember reading, there's quite a few chefs. I mean, some of them speak towards the specifics of their journey, um, but many people spend time um, in Russia or in um, refugee camps, or yeah. one person spent time um, in a camp off of the coast of Australia on an island. And so thinking about the journeys that people have taken and ending in New York, um, there's an, like I said, it's like a love letter to the city. There's a lot of people speak in their personal stories about how even though New York isn't home, it feels more at home than many of the other places that they had to travel to in order to get here. Um, So I liked that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So I'm going to um, stop sharing just so I can ask the question about Dia's story. So Dia is a um, success story in the book, um, he uh, starts with Eat Off Beat, um, but ends leaving to start his own restaurant in South Williamsburg. And you write that his journey is exactly the kind of American dream story that Eat Off Beat, wa- Eat Off Beat wants for its chefs. So thinking about that, what are your hopes for the chefs? What do you want them to achieve? And are there other examples of chefs that have gone on and formed other organizations or had their own kitchens. Yeah, actually, I mean, Dia is a great story. And like you mentioned, he's not the only one. We have uh, at least three other chefs that have gone to uh, pursue their own ventures. Uh, Chef Bashir as well, who had his own restaurant. Um, And then Chef Nasreen and Chef Rashana, who uh, have their own catering business. So for us, look, this makes us so happy. It's uh, the success is just a testimony to their talents and also hopefully to the, uh, the, the fruitful environment that they found at the kitchen that helped them, we hope to develop further their talents. So um, I, I think everybody comes to this country with the idea of the American dream and what success feels like. And actually, Probably, I don't know if it's familiar to everybody here, but refugees have to go through so many hoops and jumps, and it's so challenging that there's actually already a selection process. That means the people that have made it here, honestly, are tend to be fighter, they tend to be resilient, they tend to be people that really are ambitious and want to, want to succeed. So it's not surprising that it's in their nature to, to push and to be ambitious, whether working at our kitchen and innovating and working hard when it requires them to, and working hard with a smile, by the way, always, uh, pretty much, you know, that's not easy to find in kitchens. And then having a dream that they want to fulfill. And for us, it's, it's great because first, it's a great success story. Mm-hmm. But then for most of them, we buy back from them. So we become their customer. And we serve the same food to uh, to our customers. And maybe so just we, a small note to that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we just hope a, we have more more of these. Yeah, go ahead, Mina. Just a small mm-hmm. note: we are equally proud of other chefs who may not have necessarily 
gone on to start their own businesses, but who are continuously growing inside the company, right? Because they're all also chefs who started, they may not necessarily want to go through the entrepreneurial journey of starting their own thing, but they're really, they've become managers or senior, you know, they've been growing within the company and that's, uh, that also makes Yeah, sense. or they're creating, they're innovating within the company. That's, that's the, one of the key motivators is everybody who became a chef, and who is a talented chef, we actually push and push to, uh, to have their own the, the recipes from them. And, uh, and, uh, and it's amazing. I and mean, that's when, when we have our lunches every day, we're testing new recipes and a lot of these make it to, uh, to the customers. Yeah, and I was I was really curious about that too because you're not just developing culinary skills. Um, there, it's not like you said, it's not a nonprofit. It's not a skill program. It's not a jobs program. This is like a business, um, and it's a functioning, profiting business. Um, but thinking about how the the knowledge that chefs would learn how to set up their own business, you can connect them with resources with um, incubators and business advice. And so it's interesting to me to think about the, the knowledge that's being shared in this um, in the kitchen beyond just culinary knowledge, beyond even business knowledge. Um, but it's like a family sharing, sharing information, sharing how to navigate, um, probably sharing if there's different opportunities available to them. Um, so I found that quite interesting. Mm -hmm. and and one of the things too is like you very much emphasize expertise. So, like you said, this isn't a jobs program. It's not. No one's. Um, you're not teaching anyone. And so, one of the things that I had emphasized was um, removing the jewels from the pomegranate. And so, it's a simple tutorial on how to best get the fruit out of the pomegranate. But instead of it being like this is how you do it, it emphasizes. Nasrin and Nasrin's unique skill at opening the pomegranate. And so it's not like this is the best way to do it. It's this is how Nasrin opens it. And she does all of the pomegranates for the kitchen and she does it every day and you won't get sprayed. And also she says that pomegranate juice stains. So it's just like, it's this expertise. And I feel like I'm getting, it's the same thing when you, you would call your grandmother. You're not just getting like the ingredients. You're not just getting the steps. You're getting tips and hints about how mm -hmm. to best prepare things. Um, and so that knowledge is what is so intriguing and special, I think, about eat off meat. Absolutely. There, there was a running joke talking about pomegranates. There was a running joke at the kitchen about how Chef Nasreen had pomegranate in almost every single day. <laughs> She's always adding pomegranate, right? She's from Iran and uh, Persian cuisine. Like there's, there's a lot of pomegranates there. So it's, it is definitely one of her <laughs> favorite ingredients, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely need to pick up some pomegranate molasses. That is my favorite oh, thing. So good. And I love like the patouche salad. And then as a, it's interesting too, because you have um, chefs coming from similar regions and there's mm -hmm. obviously quite a lot of differences in the food. But when you said you're preparing a menu and having themes run through it, like ingredients are shared throughout mm -hmm. recipes, even if the chefs come from different areas. So I found that Really interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, when you walk into our kitchen, that's why we really believe our food is very wholesome, right? You walk into our pantry, it's basic ingredients, tomatoes, it's vegetables, grains, rice. There's nothing that's processed, right? It's all very basic ingredients that are good for you. Yeah. Uh, and part of it is it's very common to all chefs, to most cuisines, if we don't want to say all, uh, uh, obviously, but there's a small anecdote that do we still have time or should we start? Oh, we have tons about? of time. Yep. But by tons of time, I mean seven minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just a small anecdote to the universe, universality of food, to, to your point. I remember in the very early days, we wanted, you know, we were testing new recipes and both we had, I think it was Chef Nidal, Nidal who was from Iraq and Rashana, who's from Nepal. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just said, okay, try something new. I was kind of busy on my laptop. Juan was doing something else. And they both started boiling potatoes in, in water. Then we saw they, um, they started mashing them at the same time, right, in parallel. They both started mashing potatoes. They were not even looking at each other. Uh, then they both kind of started, they chopped some ingredients and they, they were frying something. Uh, and then we saw like they both at the same time started filling those, like they made uh, potato paste basically, and they started mm -hmm. filling those. 
And then they both had some sort of a patty, right? With uh, potatoes filled with something that they, they deep fried. Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing, right? The exact same, more or less the same ingredients. One was vegan, the other was, uh, was meat-based. Mm-hmm. But then you taste it and it's, the flavors are so different. The spices are just completely different. And you're in, like, you go into, even though it's more or less the same ingredients, obviously the spices are, are different. But you see how universal food is or we are, but at the same time, we're all, it's, it's the same thing, but also so unique and so different and so rich and so enriching in a way. So I think to me, it's one of the, my favorite moments uh, throughout our, our history, I think, when that happened and it kind of struck me that, wow, it, we're at the, at the end, we're all just the same, but also so, so different uh, and so unique. Yeah. And it translates to the cookbook too. Um, like I, as you could probably tell, I love food, I love eating and I love cooking. Um, so <laughs> um, I've read quite a few cookbooks and a lot of them will have like, you know, this is the recipe for the dough and it's for one specific recipe. But what I love is that you have say, all right, grab empanada dough and you can use the empanada dough for three other different recipes from around the mm-hmm. world. And none of them are empanadas, like not, make, not a one of them. So exactly. we make our Iraqi fatayir, we make them with empanada dough. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> yes. And the dumplings too. It's like you're making Nepali's momos, but you're getting wonton wrappers for the dumplings. And exactly. As long as it passes Rashana's, you know, standards, as long as it passes Doha's standard, like it has to go, they have to say, yes, this works. Otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> they have to approve the product, but yeah, yeah it's, it makes it accessible. It's like this food, it doesn't feel over, like you said, it's very wholesome. It doesn't feel overwhelming. It doesn't feel, even though there is the ingredient list in the beginning, it doesn't feel like you have to run to the store and get a million different ingredients. It really is home cooking um, from other people's home that you can bring into your home. Um, Love that. So well said. Yeah. We should be using it for, for a website. <laughs> Well, I like yours um, with, with the metaphor you've been you've been using. So repaying uh, <laughs> the favor with flavor. That's a really good one. Um, and uh, I guess we'll I wanted to leave off with something sweet. Um, oh, I wanted to make a brief comment. The uh, <laughs> this is just a thing that I observed, but the index in the back is so well done. Many of them, yeah. it, it's like, I love it because you have carrot and then it's a recipe for the carrot ginger. And then under ginger, it has the same recipe. And so it's a really user-friendly cookbook. Um, that's which, kudos to Workman, actually. Our team. editor, yeah, honestly, that's, that's a lot of work. But it is a lot they, of work. They did a great job with that. They did a really good mm-hmm. job, a really good job. Um, and so... One of the things I'll leave off is, uh, I guess with this recipe for, with the dessert, it's a recipe for like a healthy breakfast porridge. Um, But one of my favorite things is that you kind of adapt it for your um, customers and just put granola and yogurt with it. Uh, So that, or granola and and berries so that they have like a breakfast. Here it is, a tangy and sweet pudding with millet. So- Oh, the the yes. Right. It wouldn't traditionally have granola and berries, but for Eat Off Beats customers, they think of this as a breakfast item. So it was added. Yeah. So it's again like this food being um, traditional and like a traditional dessert, but then you're adapting it for the customers and serving it in a way that is best enjoyed. And you know, breakfast is the most challenging actually because you can you you can be as adventurous as you like for lunch and dinner. Breakfast, you're usually looking for what you're used to, right? Whether that's savory or sweet. And this is where it's been the most challenging. This is where we make the most compromises in a way. <laughs> mm, I can see that too, because you you speak about how New Yorkers are particularly adventurous. They're willing to try things, but New Yorkers love their egg and cheese and they yeah. love their bagels. So it's like, they're, yes. you're not going to divert, <laughs> divert from the set path. And honestly, that stands for everyone. It stands for yeah. us at the kitchen. Like if that's what you're used to for breakfast, you're going to go with that. But I, I found that, lunch and dinner that's easy adventurous people will, will venture into anything yeah. and I love too that the tea or coffee days as I mentioned like even with the breakfast you have to switch off between tea and coffee in the morning yeah that's usually Shanti making the call <laughs> 
again, these rules is perfect. So thank you so much, Manal and Wassam. This has been just a joy speaking with you. Um, this hour flew right by. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, so for everyone who's interested, you can purchase The Kitchen Without Borders through the Tenement Museum's bookshop. Um, you can also, there should be a link in our YouTube in order to access the um, holiday boxes with Eat Off Beat. Um, we would love for you to continue supporting Eat Off Beat. And um, if you like tonight's program, you can subscribe to the Tenement Museum newsletter um, and learn more about our virtual next events. So thank you so much. What a wonderful talk tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank have you. Good one. Yes. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.